on Auschwitz. The history of Auschwitz is exceptionally complex. It combined two functions, a concentration camp and extermination center. Nazi Germany persecuted various groups of people there and the camp complex was continually expanded and transformed. In the podcast on Auschwitz, we discuss the details of the history of the camp, as well as our contemporary memory of this important and special place. On October 7, 1944, a revolt took place in the Auschwitz II Birkenau camp in the Sonderkommando, a special war group made up largely of Jewish prisoners whom the Germans forced to work in gas chambers, burning pits areas and crematoria. Dr. Igor Bartosik of the Memorial Research Center talks about the background of resistance in the Sonderkommando and the revolt itself. The Sonderkommando was a specific group of Auschwitz prisoners, particularly the Jews who were forced by the Germans to work in the gas chambers and crematoria. When we consider the subject of resistance in Auschwitz, is there any particularity to this resistance within the Sonderkommando? And what might we call the resistant movement within this work group? This is a very interesting question. First of all, we must start by saying that at first glance, from the outside, as a historian or researcher of the subject, it may seem difficult to form a conspiracy group in such a closely guarded and isolated circle. These people are terrorized and forced to do gruesome work, most of them losing their families or loved ones. In this situation, it is very easy to fall into apathy and depression, and it would be understandable in this case if these people did not take actions that serve the common good or higher values. However, it is true that in the Sonderkommando we are dealing with a conspiracy and activities directed against the regime in the camp. Virtually every level that we come to know as the resistant movement inside Auschwitz is also focused like a lens on the activities of the Sonderkommando prisoners. Wewnątrz Auschwitz jest również jak w soczewce skupiona w działalności więźniów Sonderkommando. What then are the manifestations of this resistance that we see? Na pewno próbowali sabotować. They certainly tried to sabotage the work carried out, attempt to delay it. It was indeed dangerous. As Henrik Tauber recalls in his account, there were cases in which prisoners who delayed carrying out their task were killed by SS men, often with particular cruelty. Tauber recalls an incident where one of the Sonderkommando prisoners, who did not work fast enough, as expected by crematorium manager Otto Moll, was forced into a pit of boiling human fat. We know from the testimonies of other Sonderkommando prisoners, for example Miklos Nischli, that Moll shot at the prisoners without warning. It was simply all aimed at intimidating and forcing them to carry out their task as quickly as possible. We know that the sabotage committed by the various prisoners involved the destruction of valuables. We know that there were cases when a Sonderkommando prisoner, a dentist who extracted gold crowns, pushed one deep down the victim's throat so that it wouldn't fall into the hands of the SS. Similar was the case with valuables, which were drowned, for example, in latrines or pits near the sides of the gas chambers and crematoria. All this was done to ensure that the spoils were as limited as possible for the SS. These two can undoubtedly be called sabotage, an attempt to delay the work and also destroy valuables that the SS were very interested in. The Sonderkommando prisoners had very little chance of contact with other prisoners. Did they have any opportunity to smuggle various items they found in the changing rooms of the gas chambers into the camp? There was undoubtedly an unwritten rule that Sonderkommando prisoners returning from the crematorium area could take with them some of the most necessary and basic items, such as personal hygiene items or food obtained from the luggage of people murdered in gas chambers. However, it was definitely impossible to smuggle these things in too large quantities, as it would have aroused the suspicion of the SS. And of course, one could not smuggle valuables into the camp. We know for a fact that although the Sonderkommando prisoners had limited opportunities for contact, they were not entirely confined within their barracks and space. 
For this reason, these contacts were mostly between Zonderkommando prisoners and some of the functionary prisoners, and this is how valuables and things that could be of interest in terms of conspirational activity reached the camp, such as vast quantities of banknotes that might later be useful during escapes from the camp. We know that medicines and surgical instruments were sometimes delivered, that is, various orders and different ways of fulfilling them. Additionally, it is known that in 1944, ordinary Zonderkommando prisoners, upon releasing that there was a B2C camp just across the road that mainly housed Hungarian Jewish women in the so-called depository who were emaciated, hungry, and lacking the most basic personal hygiene items, prepared small packages and tried to throw them over the wall surrounding the courtyard of the Zonderkommando barracks across the road such that these items would fall into the B2C section. David Oler immortalized this throwing of basic necessities for the female prisoners in his painting, which clearly shows that it was quite a common attitude and not, let's say, an exceptional situation. Of course, it involved a lot of risks, but they took it anyway. What is crucial for us today, in terms of also learning about the Holocaust, was this manifestation of resistance and documenting what they saw. Yes, these people in this dramatic situation managed to master the courage to keep a record of their experiences and what they witness, and I'm referring above all to the manuscripts. After all, Zauman Gradowski's manuscript is a masterpiece. I know that some people may break it down into its constituent parts and analyze it from a literary point of view, but as far as I am concerned, a man who writes with such sensitivity about the surrounding world, with such passion, commitment and love for fellow humans, is truly a triumph of men over evil. Gradowski's manuscripts are truly remarkable. They perpetuate what Leventhal wrote in his manuscript. In the future, historians and psychologists will rack their brains over these words of ours. They will attempt to penetrate the soul of a Zonderkommando prisoner. Were it not for the material they left us, firstly, many of these events that transpired there would be shrouded in secrecy and ignorance. And secondly, we as historians, thanks to these memoirs, now have a tool with which we can show the Zonderkommando prisoners as irrefutably tragic victims of the camp. These manuscripts are also of great value. Furthermore, the manuscripts sometimes include notes that refer to transports that arrived for extermination. Here I am referring particularly to the notes of October 1944. The specific days on which people arrived for extermination are listed. The crematoria in which they were annihilated are mentioned, and approximate figures are given of how many people were exterminated then. And above all, there is, shall we say, documentation of the extermination in the form of photographs taken in July 1944 by Zonderkommando prisoners. Perhaps the idea of documenting the extermination by using photography originated earlier, but we must take into account that it was technically impossible to take photographs inside the gas chamber or furnace hall in the crematorium. To put it simply, the photography technique was such that you would have to use flash, which was practically impossible in such locations. However, when the burning of corpses in the open air was resumed during the extermination of Hungarian Jews in 1944, it was possible to take these photographs, and the prisoners took advantage of the opportunity. These photographs, depicting women going to their deaths in the gas chamber of crematorium number no. 5, and the incineration pits that can be seen behind the building are undoubtedly one of the most valuable pieces of evidence of extermination ever produced in all the death camps. Did the Zonderkommando prisoners attempt to escape and did any of them succeed? The first documented escape attempt by Zonderkommando prisoners was in December 1942. We know of the escape of two prisoners at the beginning of December, followed by a second escape on December 9th, presumably when five prisoners made a desperate attempt to escape while being transferred from Birkenau to Auschwitz I to die in the gas chamber although it is likely that such escape had also occurred earlier. Perry Broad, an assessment from the political department of the camp and hence a man who was very familiar with the question of escapes, mentions this in his memoirs. 
I was even tempted to make a conjecture, a theory, that most likely the case of the broad describes in his memoirs of the escape of two prisoners who, under cover of night and smoke, jumped into the forest and escaped from Birkenau, probably took place at the beginning of September 1942. It coincides more or less with the time of escape of the two prisoners and the night in 1942, which is clearly stated in the telegram sent out after the escaped prisoners, which indicated that they escaped during the night hours. Well, since the only group that could work at night at that time was the Zonderkommando, it is most likely that the first escape was in September. However, it is confirmed explicitly in the document as December. We later learned that there was also an escape attempt in March 1943. Two prisoners escaped, presumably while dumping ashes into the Vistula River, crossed the river and then attempted to hide in the forest near the village of Jedline, on the opposite side of the Vistula River towards the west. We also know that one of the SS men from the guard company, Jochum, forced his way across the Vistula and unfortunately captured the fugitives. The next escape documented in camp records is of course the escape of Zonderkommando prisoners during the revolt of October 7, 1944. It is undoubtedly also a mass escape that was not particularly successful. To już niewątpliwie jest także ucieczka, która ma charakter masowy, zbiorowy, no aczkolwiek nie zakończyła się ona specjalnie powodzeniem. We'll get to the events of the revolt in a moment. One more question. The Zonderkommando prisoners also have contact with a small group of SS men while working in this isolated part of the camp. On the one hand, they supervise the extermination process, while on the other, they benefit from the Zonderkommando prisoners, thanks to whom they have the chance to enrich themselves. Do we have traces of this corruption? How did it take place and were the Zonderkommando prisoners used by the SS for this? Tak, wydaje mi się, że to jest trochę mało eksponowany aspekt, a wydaje mi się, że ma naprawdę. Yes, it seems to me that it is a somewhat underexposed aspect, and in my opinion, of great importance to the history of the Zonderkommando. It is a known fact that the temptation to get hold of the victims' valuables was overwhelming. This is indisputable. The SS men had a problem in that it was difficult for them to pick up the valuables from the concrete floor of the gas chamber because they always worked in a group in the crematorium area. The group watched each other and if they wanted to obtain valuables, they certainly wanted to do so without the presence of third parties, without their knowledge and witnesses. From the accounts of Tauber, Dragon or Philip Miller, we know that this corruption took place in such a way that when the Zonderkommando prisoners collected valuables from the concrete floor of the gas chamber and according to what witnesses from the Zonderkommando recalled, although people left their clothes and personal belongings there, many of them didn't part with their valuables until the last moment. They hung onto them even when entering the gas chamber. Later, when these people were dead, the valuables fell on the concrete floor and the Zonderkommando prisoners first collected them in pots and mess tins. Then, in the crematorium area, they placed the valuables in special chests that looked like a money box with a movable lid, which could be opened from the outside. But nothing could be removed from it. And it was the duty of the Zonderkommando prisoners to put these valuables into the money box. Naturally, they threw some into it and some into their pockets. After a while, when the Zonderkommando prisoners had gathered a little more valuables, they could try to bribe the SS men. For instance, Zonderkommando prisoners would suggest to an SS man that his uniform should be ironed because it was crumpled and dirty. He would give the jacket to be ironed and at that point the Zonderkommando prisoners would place the ransom in the pockets. Everything was done without words, without any particular discussion. However, both the SS men and the Zonderkommando prisoners were keen on this agreement. For the Zonderkommando prisoners, the involvement of the SS in this illegal trade meant he no longer posed as much of a threat to them, as he already had trusted people through whom he could benefit from the valuables, while for the SS men it was a way to enrich himself. You mentioned manifestations of resistance within the Zonderkommando, which was carried out by some organized group. Who constituted the core of the conspiracy created within the Zonderkommando? Jeżeli chodzi o pierwsze Zonderkommando, które istniało od wiosny 1942 roku do grudnia 1942, 
The first Sonderkommando, which existed from the spring of 1942 to December 1942, consisted primarily of Slovak Jews, who were the first to be sent there. Later, this Sonderkommando also included Jewish prisoners who arrived in transports from Western Europe in 1942. However, the core of the conspiracy was made up of Slovak Jews, who were already familiar with the functioning of the camp and its realities, and had certain contacts among the functionary prisoners who also came from Slovakia. In December 1942, probably anticipating the partial or total liquidation of the Zonderkommando because work on the exhumation of the mass graves near Bunker No. 1 was drawing to an end, the Zonderkommando prisoners decided to stage a revolt and escape. They planned to carry it out during the night hours. There's no doubt here that the rebellion planned at the time was primarily orchestrated by Slovakian Jewish prisoners, as they were the predominant group. Of course, the revolt was forestalled by an SS action, which meant that prisoners from this Zonderkommando were taken to crematorium number no. 1 in Auschwitz and killed in the gas chamber. When the second Zonderkommando was set up, of course it was set up successively from December 1942, more or less until March 1943, two underground core groups emerged. The first core of the conspiracy comprised Jews who arrived in transport in December 1942 and January 1943. These were primarily prisoners brought from northeastern Poland, for example the Womża area, and transports that arrived from Ciechanów and so on. Among them are two people who are known to us by name and who are undoubtedly seen as pillars of the conspiracy, namely Zauman Gradowski or Zauman Leventhal. In addition, Kapo Kamiński, who was Oberkapo of the entire Zonderkommando from December 1943 onwards, can also be included in this group as an insider of conspirational activities. These are people who are later known to us because they either produced manuscripts or were active in the underground activities. The second underground group was made up of Polish communists who arrived in the transport from Paris, France, at the beginning of March 1943. Among them Jankiel Handelsmann. They were people familiar with the principles of conspirational work because most of them were associated with underground political activity and communist activity. Therefore, when they found themselves in the camp, they could quickly adapt to the situation and try to undertake underground work. In a way, one can assume that it is somewhat interesting that the two conspirational groups infiltrate and cooperate with each other, given that the Jews brought from the northeastern part of Poland are people with a traditional attitude to life, many of them religious, such as Leib Langfus, also an author of a manuscript. On the other hand, we have Jews brought from Western Europe, whose ideology is linked with communists and they are rather secularized. But as the reality and history of the Zonderkommando showed, these differences became blurred between these people and, practically speaking, without any ideological differences, they are able to cooperate. Moreover, when speaking of people involved in the conspiracy in the Zonderkommando, we must mention the Soviet prisoners of war. In April 1944, a group of nearly 20 Soviet prisoners of war were brought from Majdanek, where they manned the crematorium. They were accompanied by the German capo supervisor, Karl Topfer, and we know from the manuscripts of Leventhal that the Sonderkommando prisoners welcomed their arrival with great hope because they were soldiers. They were men acquainted with the operation of firearms, who had experienced battle and whose courage, bravery and skill would be of great use to the Zonderkommando prisoners in carrying out their conspirational plans. Waga, ich męstwo czy, czy umiejętności byłyby bardzo na rękę więźniom Zonderkommando w czasie realizacji swoich planów konspiracyjnych. Where can one discern the origins of the plan for the revolt that finally took place on October 7, 1944, and what were the reasons for conceiving a revolt? Geneza tego to luty, marzec, a najpóźniej kwiecień 1940. The genesis of the revolt can be traced back to February, March, or at the latest April 1944. Why? The beginning of 1944 saw a change of commandant and a certain shift in doctrine regarding the functioning of the camp, and above all, a significant decrease in the number of transports sent for extermination. Consequently, in December 1943, the SS carried out the first of such large-scale selections among the Zonderkommando prisoners since December 1942. More than 200 of them are deported in a transport to Majdanek and shot there. Practically speaking, this is when the Zonderkommando prisoners realize that another blow may follow at any time. 
They feel very threatened, and the death of their colleagues is confirmed by the Soviet POWs I mentioned brought in a transport from Majdanek at the beginning of April 1944. Therefore, it is probably the critical moment they realize that the only chance of survival is to obtain some weapon and fight the SS if the situation becomes critical. It is certainly a riddle who came up with the idea to smuggle gunpowder from the Union factory that had been operating since autumn 1943 into the Sonderkommando. The question as to whether this impulse came from the outside, that is, from the camp resistance movement and the heroic Jewish women who worked there, or from the Sonderkommando prisoners themselves, will remain a mystery to us. However, it is a fact that gunpowder was smuggled out of the Union factory, it reached the Sonderkommando via clandestine routes from the women directly involved in the theft of gunpowder, which was of course protected by the installation of buttons for artillery shells. The girls were Ella Gertner, Regina Schaffirstein and Estera Weisblum. Physically, however, this gunpowder reached the Sonderkommando through Ruja Robota, a prisoner employed at Effektenlager II, or so-called Canada too, where belongings of Jews murdered in the gas chambers were sorted. Prisoners from this work unit would arrive at the extermination sites in carts and load people's belongings left in the changing room onto the vehicles or carts. This was the moment contact could be made between the Zonderkommando prisoners and Truja Robota employed there. We know from the accounts of Zonderkommando prisoners, for instance Eliezer Eisenschmidt, that after some time there was so much gunpowder that they constructed primitive grenades, simply explosive placed in tinned food cans filled with gunpowder, breaking materials in the form of sharp pieces of glass, sharp stones and some nails, and everything was covered with plaster, and of course a fuse was attached in the form of a string, or alternatively some piece of cloth soaked in gunpowder. It was to be used against SS men during the battle. Later, however, the idea was also put forward to detonate some of these gunpowder in the crematorium ovens during the revolt, thus halting the extermination in Birkenau at least for some time. One questionable issue which is as yet unconfirmed is whether the Sonderkommando prisoners had firearms in their possession. Certain accounts indeed suggest that some of the Sonderkommando prisoners may have possessed such weapons, and I will say yes, obtaining them was not an impossible feat. We know that when the so-called Zerlegebetrieb, a plan for the dismantling of planes that had been shot down and brought here for demolition near the Birkenau site was first set up in 1944, it operated under the management of the Lutherwerke factory. We know that Soviet prisoners of war who worked in the area sometimes found firearms belonging to airmen in the nooks and crannies of fuselages that had been shot down and therefore had personal weapons. These weapons could have been smuggled into the camp. They could have fallen into the hands of Zonderkommando prisoners. However, there is no explicit confirmation of this fact, so I would be somewhat cautious in passing judgment here. We also have the account of Philip Miller, who claimed that after the revolt of the Ukrainian SS company, the executed Ukrainian SS men were transferred for incineration to crematorium number no. 1, which was still open at that time, that is July 1943, and Philip Miller maintained that Zonderkommando prisoners found hand grenades in the clothes of these SS men. However, this fact was also later disputed, not by historians, but eyewitnesses. One of the Sonderkommando prisoners, who also worked in the crematorium at the time, was in contact with Philip Miller. I mean Alter Weissenberg. He claimed that this was not true, that it was not the fact. Jeden z więźniów Sonderkommando, który też wtedy pracował w krematorium, był w kontakcie z Filipem Millerem. Chodzi o Altera Weissenberga. On twierdził, że to jest nieprawda, że nie było, nie było to faktem. What other weapons did the Sonderkommando prisoners have at their disposal besides primitive grenades, which they created with smuggled gunpowder? Niewątpliwie zabezpieczali się na ewentualność samoobrony. They certainly made provisions in the event of self-defense. As far as we know, some people tried to get knives that could be easily hidden, for example in the shoe top or some nooks and crannies of clothing. However, these knives needed to have blades long enough to stop an SS man when attacked. Some prisoners tried to carry heavy objects with them, a hammer, a small axe, whatever objects that could be easily hidden but useful as a weapon in a critical situation against the SS men. However, I'd like to point out one thing here. 
It is worth noting that there was not a single instance in which Zonderkommando prisoners attacked an SS man working at the crematorium. In the accounts, or even from my personal conversation with Henrik Mandelbaum, it seems that no one gave it much thought, probably because they realized that to all intents and purposes, killing these SS men would not change anything in the prisoner's situation. There may be repression, but in reality this will not change much regarding the Zonderkommando prisoner situation. Indeed, an attack occurs when it makes sense, when it's outside the camp, as was in the case during the transport of ashes to the Vistula in August 1944, when two Greeks attacked the guards and tried to get to the other side of the Vistula. Then the person who physically took the photographs in the Zonderkommando, Alex Herrera, was shot, and so this attack outside the camp, outside the ground area, surely made sense. In contrast, in the camp itself, which is fenced off and guarded by watchtowers, it would be practically suicide for a Zonderkommando prisoner and wouldn't bring any useful or positive effects. What were the plans of the Zonderkommando prisoners regarding the revolt? As we know that the plans for major camp uprising were stopped. Tak, więźniowie z Zonderkommando byli postrzegani przez przywódców konspiracji obozowej Yes, the Zonderkommando prisoners were seen by the leaders of the camp conspiracy as people who could play a key role in the event of a general uprising in the camp. They were above all determined people, well-fed, reasonably strong and a hermetic group, that is, they knew each other very well. It is much easier to create a strike group, that is, to deal with a community of several or several thousand prisoners. So the Zonderkommando was seen as the core and using this core to strike the SS men could be the first phase of a general uprising in the camp. I know that the leaders of the camp conspiracy considered such an uprising in July 1944 and it was associated with the Bagration offensive moving westward at the much faster pace and had it not been stopped on the Vistula line, it was likely that Marshal Rokosowski troops would have reached Auschwitz probably at the turn of July and August 1944, which was when a possible uprising was considered. A revolt in such a large camp, at the rear of the front, could have severely disorganized the German defenses, but as Operation Bagration was stopped, the uprising planned for July 1944 was put on hold. The plan for the uprising was as follows. The Zonderkommando prisoners were to attack the SS men in the evening as they headed for their positions in the guard towers located just outside the camp fence. In doing so, the first weapons would be acquired and with these weapons attack various sectors of the camp, liquidate the SS men stationed at the Blockführerstube and watchtowers, acquire more weapons and involve more prisoners in the general uprising in the camp. So that's the way it was meant to proceed in July 1944, but as I said, it was put on hold. We know following the suspension that a period of chaos ensues as far as the Zonderkommando conspiracy is concerned. The consequence of this action, which was halted at the last minute, as recalled by Henrik Tauber, was the unmasking of some of the Zonderkommando prisoners. Some associate the death of Kapo Kaminski with the very fact that their revolt was stopped at the last moment, leading to some prisoners being unmasked and thus later becoming victims of actions by the SS. Also, Herrera's escape was probably caused by the very chaos that ensued at that time. It is rather difficult to suppose that Alex, a Greek Jew who neither knew the terrain nor the language, assumed he would survive in hiding for several months. He probably hoped that the offensive would be launched and that within the few days or so, the leading forces of the Soviet army would reach Auschwitz. Therefore, he made a desperate attempt to escape at the beginning of August, during which he died. In a way, one can see that the Zonderkommando prisoners are at the crossroads, because on the one hand, such a general revolt in the camp, where several or a dozen thousands of people would join the fight, was a situation that gave them a chance of survival, as it would have been a powerful revolt. The Zonderkommando prisoners would have disappeared into the crowd of other prisoners. In contrast, an isolated action carried out by the Zonderkommando alone is extremely difficult, and the chance of survival is significantly lower. Therefore, it is difficult to deny the right of the Zonderkommando prisoners to a possible revolt also aimed at saving themselves. After all, they were ordinary people who also wanted to live, and so their hope in revolt and escape. <laughs>
It is evident that it would have been easier to carry out a revolt in such a situation had there been a general uprising in the camp. So one can see from the manuscript of, say, Leventhal, that he is embittered and even reproaches the camp conspiracy, that it didn't provide adequate assistance to the Zonderkommando prisoners and that they were only needed when it was necessary to acquire valuables needed for escapes, when it was necessary to document the criminal activities of the SS, for example photographs, then the Zonderkommando was good. But when it comes to the possibility of saving themselves, no one takes their side. It is clear in Leventhal's manuscript that he is embittered by the situation. And in doing so, the news begins to tighten. The extermination of the Hungarian Jews came to an end, and then the crematoria continued to work intensively for several weeks in the second half of August 1944, and then in September, a period when significantly fewer transports were sent to their deaths. The SS decided to reduce the number of Sonderkommando prisoners, which at the time reached a record high of over 870 prisoners. The first selection was carried out and resulted in the death of almost 230 Sonderkommando prisoners, probably on September 23, 1944. They were killed in what was known as Canada One, that is the storehouse for items taken from people dying in the gas chambers, and the prisoners were killed in a chamber used for disinfection. They were killed using Cyclone B. The SS tried to conceal the murder of these Zonderkommando prisoners from the other prisoners of the Special Commando because it had been announced earlier that the more than 200 people would be transferred to work in one of the subcamps. To conceal this crime, the corpses were transported in trucks to crematorium number 3. The staff who worked there at the time were ordered to go upstairs to the living quarters and the SS men placed the corpses in the crematorium furnaces by themselves. Nevertheless, when the Zonderkommando prisoners later examined the ash pits, they found objects among the ashes of the burnt men that indicated their fellow prisoners most likely had these items with them when they were taken from the Birkenau site the day before. So the Zonderkommando knew right away that this news was tightening and action would have to be taken swiftly. Otherwise, soon there simply might not be enough time. I trzeba będzie podjąć działania jak najszybciej, ponieważ wkrótce może być już po prostu za mało czasu. What were the reason for the revolt that finally broke out on October 7, 1944? The foundation has been late, but did everything proceed as the Zonderkommando conspiracy had imagined? Tak więc zapowiedziano kolejną selekcję. Znowu zapowiedziano, że będzie zabranych 300 więźniów, którzy mają być przeniesieni... Another selection was planned. Again, they announced that 300 prisoners would be transferred to work in one of the subcamps, but knowing the fate of the people taken two weeks earlier, the Zonderkommando had no illusion that this would be another liquidation operation. It was announced that this time the crew managing crematorium number five would be downsized and accommodated in crematorium number four, which then was closed. The fear within the Zonderkommando was growing. The search for salvation began, and the assumption was that, as was the case on September 23, 1944, the Zonderkommando would most likely be reduced again by the prisoners who had been assigned to work there in recent months, particularly those who had been assigned to work in the Zonderkommando in May of 1944 during the extermination of Hungarian Jews. One other detail later influenced the course of events that took place on October 7, 1944. According to memoirs and manuscripts, a verbal altercation, followed by fistcuffs, ensued the day before October 7, 1944, between one of the Soviet prisoners of war who worked in crematorium number no. 3 and an SS man from the crematorium staff. A scuffle broke out and eventually the SS man drew his pistol and shot the prisoner. At the same time, the SS Commando Führer announced that the Soviet POWs would be sent away on the next transport from the camp area. Of course, they realized what this implied and assumed and feared that they might be included in the transport departing on October 7. During conversations held within the Zonderkommando, it was agreed that the revolt would still be put on hold because the plan to destroy the crematorium ovens was still on the minds of the Zonderkommando prisoners. Moreover, they assumed that an operation carried out at night would be a better and more convenient way to start a revolt within the crematorium area. It would give the escapees a slightly better chance of breaking out of the camp area and saving themselves. Meanwhile, the selection of October 7 was announced for noon, which also meant that the prisoners were placed in very unfavorable circumstances because it was in the middle of the day 
with at least seven more hours until nightfall, meaning that the time for pursuit was extended. The Zonderkommando leadership gave carte blanche to the prisoners who found themselves in this transport to mount resistance against the SS men. However, it was assumed that firstly there could be no unmasking, that is, they could not use the grenades in their possession, and that if the SS were to be attacked it would be done primarily with simple tools, white weapons. In the afternoon, shortly after 1 p.m., an assembly was announced in the area of crematorium number 4. The SS men summoned the prisoners for roll call and began to read out the names of prisoners included in the transport. Once the names were read out, the prisoners stopped coming forward to join the column that was to leave the crematorium. It starts to get messy and noisy, shouting ensues, and at some point the Zonderkommando prisoners throw themselves at the SS men. Of course, they attacked them with simple tools, so a clash between an armed man wielding a machine gun, rifle or even a small firearm and a man armed with a hammer or bottle is not an incident destined to end in a clear-cut result. The SS men opened fire. Some prisoners tried to get through and hide in the area of crematorium number 5. It is known that some people used bizarre spots as places of refuge, such as the chimney of the then decommissioned crematorium furnace or a pile of wood, among others. Some of them fell at an exit gate leading from the courtyard of the crematorium number 4. When the SS opened fire on the prisoners fleeing from the courtyard of crematorium 4, some retreated into the building and set fire to the bunks and straw mattresses there. It was presumably an act of desperation, as the general signal urging all prisoners to revolt in the camp to rise was supposed to be the setting of this building on fire. So it may have been set on fire because they hoped the shooting, the commotion in the area of crematorium number 4, heard throughout the camp, plus the burning crematorium, would encourage people to fight. But of course it was only a theoretical assumption. Eventually the prisoners who found themselves there later left the building from the raging fire and died from the gunshots of the SS men. The situation was brought under control very quickly at crematorium number 4. The prisoners were terrorized, locked first in the undamaged gas chamber of crematorium 4. As soon as the fire broke out, the camp's fire brigade was called in from Auschwitz 1 to put out the fire. There is even an interesting detail that when the firefighters arrived at crematorium 4, unrolled the hoses and were about to start the motor pump, one of the prisoners, a fireman, tried to sabotage the operation of the engine to delay the action to the extent possible, so the fire would spread over the crematorium and destroy it considerably. Eventually, however, a pistol was held to his head by an SS man. The pump switched on momentarily and the firefighting operation got underway. Witnesses from the fire brigade recalled that the prisoners were taken to the square in front of the crematorium, laid out on the grounds and randomly executed, which was also mentioned in the account of Zonderkommando prisoners who were in the area. That's pretty much how the revolt played out in crematorium number 4 and 5. What then happened at crematorium number 2? One could hear the shooting from afar and see the fire and smoke from the burning crematorium 4. The Soviet prisoners felt threatened and anxious, while an SS unit was advancing toward the crematoria. It was probably a question of securing the area. As the SS were afraid, the fight, the revolt might spread to crematoriums 2 and 3. The POWs panicked, probably thinking that the unit was coming to whisk them off, and not thinking much of it, one of them stopped Capo Karo Topfer, who, by the way, had a rather poor opinion among the Zonderkommando prisoners. The Capo was pushed into the crematorium furnace. Attempts were further made to lure SS men into the building, but already sensing danger, they left crematorium too and refused to go inside. The prisoners in crematoria 2 and 3 tried to make contact with each other, but this didn't work. And seeing that a certain line had been crossed from which there was no return, the Jewish prisoners from the Zonderkommando in crematorium 2 decided to carry out the operation planned earlier, at least to a limited extent. Firstly, they wanted to detonate explosives in the furnaces. Three prisoners stayed in the crematorium area to carry out the detonation, while the remaining 80 or more headed south broke through the camp fence, ran through the so-called Klerenlager, and seizing the opportunity they also cut wires in the women's section, hoping the female prisoners would join the escape, and then the SKPs headed south. The problem was how to force through the so-called Grosse Postenkette, 
a large guard chain of primitive wooden towers that surrounded the entire beer canal area like a ring during the day. It was simply a matter of allowing the prisoners to move about very freely in the unfenced area where they worked. On the other hand, a large chain of posts ensured that no one could get beyond this area. When the Zonderkommando prisoners moved towards these boats, apparently one of the SS men panicked, threw away his rifle and ran away as fast as he could. The SKPs ran southwards. They opted for this direction because it was the only possible escape direction. Besides, to the south of Birkenau, about 20 kilometers from the camp, are the first peaks of the Beskide mountain ranges. Presumably, the Zonderkommando prisoners who saw the mountains from the crematorium area assumed that the mountains would be a convenient place to hide. They also assumed that there might be some partisan groups in that they could join and continue the fight. However, they didn't realize, first of all, that when they made an attempt to revolt and escape, an emergency unit from Auschwitz I was summoned, which was heading towards the village of Poave in Loris. Secondly, there were farm ponds just behind the camp to the south, which made escape difficult because the prisoners had to sneak through causeways. The Zonderkommando prisoners were probably taken by surprise by the SS pursuit unit on the grounds of the camp farm in Poave, under construction at the time. They were probably shot at with bullets from machine guns, and these bullets ignited one of the barracks or farm buildings located on the grounds of a homestead in Poave. I would also like to add that as the prisoners were running towards the south, they encountered a three-person SS patrol on one of the roads around the camp area and stabbed them to death. This escape group was intersected at one of the ponds, shots were fired at the prisoners, and some were killed at this particular crossing between the edge of the pond and the causeway. About 80 of them were killed there. However, three people who were not shot then separated from this escape. Two were Zonderkommando prisoners. One, a Soviet POW, Alexander Serkalenko, the other, a certain Meyer Plishko, and the third, Moshe Sobotko. It is worth noting that Meyer Plishko was not a Zonderkommando prisoner, but his brother was and seeing his Zonderkommando colleagues escaping, decided to join them. However, we do not know the fate of these SKPs, although probably none of them survived. Some Zonderkommando prisoners mentioned that a Soviet prisoners of war was brought to the crematorium area and shot after a few weeks, so probably it was the POW that I mentioned earlier. How many prisoners died as the result of the revolt, as some died during the fight and others during the escape, or as a result of SS repression? Określenie dokładnie, ilu więźniów zginęło na terenie krematorium numer 4 i 5, ilu zmieninek zginęło na terenie krematorium It is simply impossible to determine precisely how many prisoners died in crematoria 4 and 5 and how many in crematorium 2 or as a result of repressions or fighting. We cannot quantify these figures precisely and accurately. All I can say that the Zonderkommando decreased by about 450 people. We are not able to say whether this number also include the two SKPs who survived, and there is also Kapo Topferkasus. On October 8, 1944, a telegram was sent from Auschwitz urging the pursuit of escaped prisoners and mentioned the escapes from October 7, 1944, who I referred earlier, Szelkalenko, Sobotko and Pliszko, but also mentioned Kapo Topfer. He was burned in the crematorium furnace. His body was not found. However, police procedures are such that he must also be included in the pursuit documents in the circumstance. The telegram also stated that he had probably been killed and his body burned in the crematorium, but they had to issue a call for pursuit and search for these people since he was not there. Therefore, we assume that about 450 prisoners were shot during the Zonderkommando revolt, the fight and escapes, and during the execution. Włącznie w czasie buntu Zonderkommando zostało zastrzelonych w trakcie walki, ucieczki, a także w czasie egzekucji. However, the Germans didn't completely liquidate the Zonderkommando, because this group was still needed, right? Tak, nie likwidują Zonderkommando, ono jest nadal jeszcze potrzebne, niemniej zaczyna się śledztwo. Yes, they didn't liquidate the Zonderkommando. It was still needed. Nonetheless, an investigation was launched. One thing that undoubtedly mattered here was that firstly, when the SS men broke into crematorium number two, 
there were still three prisoners there who intended to blow up the crematorium furnaces. Explosive materials was found on them. Leventhal's account also showed that these primitive grenades, which the Zonder Commando had constructed, were also used by the SKPs heading south. When the SS found these primitive grenades on the bodies of the SKPs or on those prisoners who had been captured in Crematorium 2, it became clear instantly that the trail would lead to the detonator factory, the Union factory. The search of the prisoners' living quarters and for the prisoners themselves was launched immediately. The first interrogations began and the result was that in within a few days, three or a dozen Zonderkommando prisoners were taken from Birkenau area and thrown into Block 11. They were interrogated and tortured. Consequently, the assessment traced the female prisoners I mentioned earlier who worked at the Union factory and supplied gunpowder to the Zonderkommando. The Zonderkommando had already been reduced in size, but they still worked for three weeks at the crematoria and on transports that continued to be sent to Auschwitz for extermination. Pracowało jeszcze przez trzy tygodnie przy obsłudze krematoriów, przy transportach, które wtedy trafiały jeszcze na zagładę do Auschwitz. All episodes of the On Auschwitz podcast are available at auschwitz.org slash podcasts. We kindly ask you to support our mission and share our podcast in social media.